Today I've been asked to talk with you about a very difficult topic. It's about the Middle East, that part of the world that's between Africa and Asia. I used to live there for 20 years. I've actually been to Israel four times and travelled through it. And I want to explain to you what's happening there and why it's happening, what's going on. Now, it's difficult actually to talk about this whole issue because Christians themselves don't agree about what's happening. And let me explain. About 4,000 years, God spoke to a man named Abraham. He said to Abraham, go to a land that I'm going to show you and I will give that land to you and to your descendants forever. And eventually, Abraham got the land. It was called Canaan. And after some time, his descendants took possession of the land and they had to first drive out the earlier inhabitants. The Canaanites and the Philistines had been involved in all kinds of sin, such as child sacrifice, and God is holy and God judges sin. And so God sent the people of Israel, Abraham's descendants, into the land and they took possession of it. Now, this is where Christians divide into two groups. Group one says, possessing the land was the result of God's promise and they would live there forever. And they have verses of the Bible to support this and you can see the verses there in the little box. But a second group we call them group two, says, yes, possessing the land was the result of God's promise, but promises have conditions. And God gave them a condition before they went in. He said, if you do good, you'll stay in the land, but if you disobey, the land will vomit you out like it did the previous inhabitants. And that's what happened. The Jews, the chosen people of God, went into the land, but they didn't obey God. They worshipped idols, they worshipped false gods, and so God used the armies of foreign countries, of Assyria and Babylon, to come into the land to destroy the temple and to take the Israelites, who were later called the Jews, out of the land of Israel into exile. Well, group one says, yes, that's true, but God promised that they would return, and they did return after 70 years. And group two says, yes, they did return, but then Christ came. Christ is the promised Messiah and he now does all that Israel was supposed to do. Group 1 replies, yes, Christ did come, but there were also promises about the rebuilding of the temple, about the Jews returning to the land and to all Israel being saved. And you can see both sides have lots of Bible verses which they would use to support their view. Group 2 responds, no, the Bible describes Jesus as the end of the law the church as the Israel of God, Christians as the true temple, and the Old Testament or the Old Covenant as obsolete. Group 1 says, you're engaging in replacement theology. You're simply replacing the Old Testament Jews with the New Testament Christians. And Group 2 says, no, it's not replacement, it's fulfillment theology. Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And Paul writes, all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. Now we could go on for days and days talking about these two views. They're very highly developed. Here's the names of them in case you're interested, you want to look them up later. Group one is called dispensationalism or Christian Zionism. And group two is called covenant theology. And there are good scholars on both sides, as you can see. People, and I know a couple of these guys. Mark Jury is a colleague of mine at MST, and I know Colin Chapman as well. But what is really important is that godly Christians, Bible-believing people, can disagree on these issues and still be friends, and they can still worship, and they can serve, and they can witness together. Christians can disagree without being disagreeable. But one thing that Christians do agree on is the history of Israel. Many nations have occupied the land of Israel at different times. And here's a list of them. You can see countries just took their turns overrunning Israel before they'd get kicked out by the next group and then they would take over. In Jesus' time, it was the Romans. The temple had been rebuilt before Jesus came and the Romans destroyed it. And there was a Roman emperor whose name was Hadrian who wanted to get rid of the Jews because they were always rebelling and so he renamed the land Israel as Palestine because he wanted to get rid of Jewish history. And that's where the name Palestine comes from. It's from the word Philistines. 
But eventually, the Romans became Christian, and so Israel became a Christian-ruled land for several centuries. And many churches were built there. And if you go to Israel, you can go and visit these churches that have been there for nearly 2,000 years. But in 637, 600 years after Jesus, Muslims invaded and conquered Israel. And they built a gold-covered shrine called the Dome of the Rock, which is there, I've been inside that a couple of times, on the site of the ruined Jewish temple. And so now Jews and Christians and Muslims all claim Jerusalem is a holy city. But heavy taxation by the Muslims on Jews and Christians was hard for them, and so many of them converted to Islam as a result. And within a few centuries, Israel, which had been a Jewish country, became a Christian country, now has become a Muslim country. Now, under Islamic law, any country which has ever been ruled by Muslims can never be handed back to non-Islamic rule. The Muslims ruled over Israel, Palestine, for 13 centuries. They expect that at some stage, Islam will rule the world. That's their expectation and hope. Many of the Jews moved out of Israel to other countries, and they were often persecuted there by both Christians and by Muslims. And the Jews wanted a safe place to live in. So in the late 1800s, some of them decided to move back to Israel and they began buying plots of land from the Arab people that were living there. There had been Jews in the the Holy Land all the way through anyway. But in the Second World War, the Muslims sided with the Germans and they lost. So the British took over the land and then more Jews started to come. During World War II, the Holocaust took place, in which six million Jews were killed by the Nazis. And Europeans felt sorry for the Jews, and so they supported their movement into the land of Israel. But the Palestinians, who were Arabs, mostly Muslim, but some Christians, didn't like the Jews moving into their land, and so they began fighting with them. And so for decades, there was fighting between the Jews and the Palestinians who had lived there, the Arabs. Eventually, Britain got tired of this, so they handed it over to the United Nations. And the United Nations split the land into two parts. They said, here's a Jewish part, and here's a Palestinian part. And the Jews agreed to this, but the Palestinians said, no, we will not allow the Jews to live here. The Jews proclaimed the state of Israel as a new nation in 1948. Now, for dispensationalist Christians, remember Group 1, this was very important. They said, this is the fulfilment of prophecy. The Jews are now back in the land. They can rebuild the temple. They will become Christians, and then Jesus will return. So this was their perception. For covenant Christians, they said, no, this is just a political event. The Jews needed a safe place to live. They now have one, but this won't affect the return of Jesus at all. But for the Arabs... Having the Jews in their land was a disaster. They didn't want them in there, and so they began attacking Israel. The day after Israel declared independence, Arabs from all the nations around them came into Israel and started attacking them. Unfortunately, the Jews were very good soldiers. Within 10 months, even though they were greatly outnumbered and outgunned, they had not only driven back the Arab soldiers, they'd also occupied a lot of the Palestinian territory. They'd taken the territory that the United Nations said belonged to the Palestinians, and they'd gone into Jerusalem and taken control of half of that. The Palestinians were forced out of it, and 700,000 of them became refugees, and some of their descendants are still living in refugee camps today. When you hear of a refugee camp in Gaza, these are the descendants of the people from this war. They hope one day to return to their own land, but at the same time, a million Jews were also expelled from Arab countries, and they also became refugees, and most of them settled in Israel. So we had a massive movement of people. Well, the Palestinians never accepted the coming of the Jews, and they continued to fight against them. They used terror tactics like suicide bombers. The lady in the top middle there was a suicide bomber. Rock throwing. The Jews responded strongly. They killed and arrested Palestinians. They destroyed their homes, and they started building Jewish settlements in the Palestinian areas. <laughs> 
In 1967, the Arabs tried to attack the Jews again. They surrounded them from every side, but the Jews defeated them in a six-day war, and they took even more territory from the Arabs, taking land from Egypt and from Jordan and from Syria. Eventually, they handed most of it back, but the Palestinians still do not accept the right of Israel to be in the land. And groups like Hamas, and there's the five major Palestinian groups up there, have, are dedicated to eradicating the Jews. That's where it stands at the moment. And as part of that, last month, October the 7th, Hamas sent 1,500 fighters from Gaza, an area in the south, into Israel to kill and kidnap as many Jews as possible. And on that day, 1,200 people were killed and 240 were kidnapped and taken back to Gaza as hostages. Gaza also uses its own people as human shields. It doesn't allow them to leave areas where Hamas fighters are hiding. And so Israel, after a few weeks, then went into Gaza. They attacked Gaza in an attempt to capture and to kill the Hamas soldiers. In the process, they dropped about 12,000 bombs on Gaza, and they claim that has killed thousands of Hamas fighters. But Hamas says the bombs have killed 11,000 citizens. They don't dif differentiate between citizens and fighters. And so we see uh, pictures of bombed houses and Gazan women and children who have been killed and wounded. One of the rules of law is that civilians, that is non-soldiers, should be protected as much as possible. And Israel says they try to do this. They drop pamphlets warning people that they're going to drop a bomb on the house saying you have 10 minutes to get out. Sometimes they call them up on their phone saying leave your house immediately, it's going to be destroyed. But despite this, many more people are killed every day and the fighting and killing goes on. In God's sight, every life is precious, whether it's Jewish or Christian or Muslim or whatever. And so the United Nations and Hamas have called for a ceasefire by Israel, but the Jews are saying Hamas must release their hostages first. The situation really isn't going to be resolved until both sides recognise the right of the other side to exist and they look for ways to live side by side in peace. Jesus lived in Israel and that time it was an occupied state. It was occupied by the Romans. And amongst the 12 apostles, there was a man named Simon. Simon hated the Romans. He was a zealot and the zealots were a group of terrorists who wanted to drive out the Romans by killing them. Another of the 12 apostles was Matthew. He worked for the Romans. He was a tax collector. He would collect money from the Jews to give to the Romans. He was a collaborator. He worked for the enemy. Now, these two men should have been natural enemies, but Jesus is the one who changes hearts. And he freed Simon from a life of hatred and violence to one of peacefully preaching the gospel. Jesus freed Matthew from a life of greed and exploiting his own people to one of serving the people. Only Jesus can change people's hearts. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's the one who broke down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. He calls us to be peacemakers. He says in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers. There are two important things that we can do. Firstly, we can pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for Israel and Palestine. Pray for the Jews who are mourning the deaths, for Muslim Palestinians who are also mourning deaths and living in fear, for Palestinian Christians. There's still a significant number of Christians that are living there, that God's mercy and grace would be upon them. Another practical thing we can do is to share the good news of the gospel of peace with Jews and Muslims and with everyone else, because Jesus is the one who changes people's hearts. Jesus is really the only hope that we have for our world. That's something that all Christians can agree on, no matter what group they belong to. Thank you very much.